Hello, this is Royce Cumming, and I'm here to share with you Philiady, Masquerade Masters. Just a little bit about me, for those of you who do not already know me. My name is Royce Cumming, and I am a kind of general entomologist, dabbling in quite a variety of different subfields in the world of entomology. And my route into entomology started off somewhat untraditional. I wanted to keep entomology as a side passion and hobby for the longest time, uh, even doing my undergrad in business administration, because I felt that keeping an entomology as uh, fun on the side was a good way to relax. However, over the years, it ended up that I kept getting paid to do different entomology work and consigned to do things. And it slowly, of course, with many entomologists know, it took over my life. I got to uh, end up traveling the world to many great places, meeting amazing people, and seeing so many amazing insects, where bit by bit, it became full-time and... I have uh, very, very much fallen in head, head over heels into the world of entomology, and it is uh, through and through what I love. One of the things that I love about entomology is how many subfields there are. So a couple of different worlds of entomology that I've jumped into over the years. Uh, I've done work with paleoentomology. I've worked with live butterfly exhibits and entomology education. Uh, my master's was actually in forensic entomology. And then I transitioned into doing my PhD in evolutionary biology and systematics and taxonomy. So that's one of those fun things about entomology is that if you get bored with one topic, you know, pivot, do something else. There's so many different little facets of entomology and so many amazing things you can do with it. But today I want to share with you my absolute favorites, and that is the phyleidae, the walking leaves. They are such an underrated and really bizarre group of insects that the more we start to dig into them, the more fun we're having with them. But you know, what's not to like? They are a very charismatic insect. They're beautiful, great camouflage. They're a very large insect that you know, many people have either you know, seen in, on display in a museum or in a zoo or you know, uh, photos in a book as an example of great camouflage because they, they really are fantastic camouflage. From the top and even to the bottom. So these are Pulcrophyllum gigantium in Malaysia showing some of the undersides of leaves. Uh, in these tropical environments where leaf insects reside, you know, it's so humid and wet that sometimes you get moss and lichen and you know, fungi growing underneath leaves. And even these Pulcrophyllum gigantium, they've got this great mimicking of camouflage where even the underside, they get this great modeling of color. So. Leaf insects come in quite a variety of sizes and shapes and colors. Uh, these on the left, we have Microphyllium haskeli, next, which is one of the smallest species, next to Pulcrophyllium gigantium, you know, one of the largest species. So we've got every size in between, quite the variety of shapes and sizes. And then on the right, we have one single species in a variety of three different colors. So you know, they've got this perfect leaf shape, and they also end up in that beautiful leaf coloration. Uh, reds and browns and yellows and oranges. Absolutely beautiful. You know, many, pe many people think they're really fascinating and beautiful. And they are just a really cute insect. You know, they're kind of funny. They sway around. They don't bite. They don't sting. Uh, they're just a, a really cute insect that is just trying to be a leaf. They want to blend in. They don't want anyone to find them. But, you know, people, as people start to learn more about leaf insects, uh, they are really a fascinating insect. Some of the earliest accounts of leaf insects are likely from Ferdinand Magellan's circumnavigation of the world, uh, where he had a naturalist with him, Antonio Pigafetta, who, when they made it to the Philippines, he said, In this island are also found certain trees, the leaves of which, when they fall, are animated and walk. They are like the leaves of the mulberry tree, but not so long. They have the leaf stalks short and pointed, and near the leaf stalk they have on each side two feet. If they are touched, they escape, but if crushed, they do not give out blood. I kept one for nine days in a box. When I opened it, the leaf went round the box. I believe they live upon air. So, you know, I feel bad for that poor little leaf insect that was starved in a box for nine days, but this is, you know, just an extreme curiosity for the leaf insects that has persisted for many, many hundreds of years. As leaf insects started to make their way back into Europe, uh, there was a care, you know, they were kind of characterized as this amazing camouflage insect. And they were included in quite a variety of works. These are a couple of beautiful illustrations from old texts, you know, talking about the master camouflage, the leaf insects. And they've left their mark on culturally. Uh, there's a significant cultural uh, significance 
with raising these as pets across Europe. Uh, there's even accounts back into the 1800s, uh, such as this article from 1889 saying, So long ago as 1854, a living specimen of an Indian species, Pulcrophyllium scythe, was exhibited in the botanical gardens, where it attracted so much attention that it was found necessary to limit its, its exhibition to four days in each week. This restriction was adopted because, in spite of the old saying that seeing is believing, it was found in the case of this insect that seeing was disbelieving. On those who inspected it, insisting there was no insect on the plant at all, but only a leaf, it had to be stirred up to convince them of the truth. And this process of continual provocation was found to be very injurious to the constitution of so peaceful a creature. Which, I just love that description of leaf insects as a peaceful creature, because they really are. They're just trying to blend in, never be seen, and just go about their, li you know, their leafy life eating leaves. A couple other fun little cultural asides I want to share with you. One is uh, there is a report of leaf insect poop being used to brew tea, uh, along with the poop of Heteroteryx dilatata. Uh, they claim to have medicinal value, curing diarrhea and gastroenteritis. So you know, some funny little things throughout time. Uh, they've been popular in stamps and postcards and cigar bands and uh, brooches and pins and toys. So, you know, they're, they are considered a cute, you know, interesting, really fascinating creature. But that's just barely scratching the surface. As we dig deeper into the science of them, things really get exciting. And that's what I'm really hoping to share with you today. Here's a, a couple of other fun ones. Art, cartoons. Uh, I've seen many, many leaf insect tattoos. Uh, just shows how much people really love these and think they're really a bizarre creature. But the more you know, the more bizarre they get. So here's one of my absolute favorite photos. Can you spot the leaf insects? And now if you answer me, oh yes, I see 45 leaf insects. No, you are counting the leaves. You're not counting the insects. Uh, there are, and I'm going to reveal them here in just a second. Three, two, one. There are nine leaf insects in this photo. Uh, did you see them all? We've got adults of a couple different species. We have a male, we have several nymphs. Really spectacular camouflage. So during the day, their thin abdomen lets the light pass through them. And look at the venation of the wings. You know, it just matches that guava just so beautifully. So really spectacular insect, any way you slice it. Beautiful, large. Uh, really fascinating camouflage, but the more you dig into the science, the more exciting they get. And that's what I'm hoping to present with you today, is move beyond just them being cute insects and start to push you into, okay, there is some really spectacular science that we can dig into more. Leaf, and, leaf insects in general, they are relatively poorly known, to be honest. Um, of the 100 plus species we know, about a third of them I'd be classified as, you know, well-known. You know, many, many people have them as pets or they're in many museum collections or they've, you know, got a decent range or they've been observed multiple times in nature. But on the contrary, about a third of them are also incredibly rare, known only from the single holotype specimen. Uh, this one specimen was found and that species has never been seen since. Um, absolutely bizarre. And then the other, you know, percentage up there, those are also incredibly rare. Just, you know, two or three specimens, a handful of specimens in museums around the entire world. Very little is known about them. So the tough thing is, is even those well-known species, even though they're well-known to the point of, oh, you know, we've got many museums around the world have them, many of those species were from cultures where, you know, like just a couple of specimens were found in the wild, brought into culture. Uh, this is a friend of mine in Java who has a big rearing facility in his backyard where he has just a continual population growing so that he can uh, produce these uh, as in kind of bulk, dry them and sell them to museums, collectors, you know, artists all around the world. Uh, because many people are so fascinated by them. They're really a spectacular insect you see framed all over and in uh, many gift shops and things like that. Uh, but that is not a good representation of, you know, a well-known species. Oh, this is, you know, from one single location, um, and you know, probably from even maybe even a single female, then because they're parthenogenic, she just laid many many eggs, and we got to this point where you know many people are familiar with this species. But still, it's not a good representation of you know the actual range, the genetic diversity, or many other things about them. So even those species that I say are well known, 
there's still a lot that we don't know about them. Mostly that's because the leaf insects are very hard to find. You know, they've got this beautiful camouflage to avoid the being detected by predators. However, uh, they also avoid detection by naturalists and entomologists. That's because the leaf insects are up in the canopy. As soon as they hatch from their eggs, they run up in the canopy and it's very unlikely for them to come down. Uh, you know, the only time they may come down is when they die and they uh, fall to the forest floor where ants immediately devour them and there's nothing left for an entomologist to find. Really the only, you know, the best time to go out and find leaf adult female leaf insects down low is the day after a really intense storm. Uh, in cases like this, uh, the storm comes through and shakes the tops of the trees and the leaf insects get knocked down to the forest floor. But you need to go out hiking the very next day because as soon as they the storm comes down, those leaf insects are going to run to the nearest tree and run back up into the canopy. So it's really fun exploring the museums of the world because as you go through the museums and you start to you know, see the different insects, I always like to look up and research the people who found them if they do have the collector's name on the label. More often than not, it's not an entomologist. It happened to be a herpetologist or mammologist or botanist who's out in the field uh, just happened to have a leaf insect fall at their feet. And really, the study of leaf insects has been by chance. You know, many museums around the world have hundreds of years of natural history collections, and they may only have a couple leaf insects. Uh, some of the old specimens that I have seen, every time I get a chance, I try to find the journals from these old expeditions. And there's been several that I've found that have absolutely just great, great stories in them, where they say, oh, today was a horrible day. It was storming all day. I didn't get to collect anything. I hated today. And then the journal entry for their very next day is, oh, amazing. I'm so excited today. I found leaf insects. So it's one of those fun things that they're just so hard to find. Most of them are by chance. Also, one of those great things is iNaturalist. This has been the tool uh, for the last couple of years that has absolutely blown up the leaf insect world because they're so difficult to find, and they are usually typically found by chance. It does take millions of people out there with smartphones, uh, always photographing nature and trying to record what they see. And you know, the, the higher the chances of people out there looking, the more likely we're gonna get lucky. Just every now and then, great leaf insects get found. So bit by bit, we're slowly starting to develop our understanding of their biogeographic distributions. Uh, I've seen so many uh, undescribed species at a Thai naturalist. Uh, the more we dig, the more we're finding. It's just getting more and more exciting. So just a little bit more general about the leaf insects before we dive into some of their interesting science behind them. This is the current range of the extant, you know, the living species of leaf insect. And they actually occur in quite a variety of environments. Uh, most of these can be found from sea level, uh, very, very hot environments, up into several thousand meters elevation. Uh, the highest record we have is 2,700 meters in you know, a pretty temperate and very different environment than you find down at sea level. In fact, many of those high elevation species, if you do bring them down into cooler or into warmer areas, uh, they will not be able to survive. They're uh, in, they're have evolved to withstand these, you know, very interesting diversity of climates. But there's been a number of issues that have plagued the leaf insects over the years, you know, trying to understand uh, their diversity and actually start to understand this group. Because most people for the longest time have assumed the leaf insects are just like a novelty. They're not a very diverse group. There's not very much exciting going on with them. Uh, but the more we explore, the more we're finding. But there's been some issues through the years and you know, some difficulties that we've had to overcome. Uh, one of them is intraspecific variation, where a single species can be quite variable, which when you think about the trees, you know, leaves in a tree, uh, there is quite a bit of variation. And even within a single species of leaf insect, here's two different species. You've got the Phyum gantengens on the left and the Phyum jacobsoni on the right. Uh, just showing some of the variation in the abdominal shape, uh, some of the shapes of the lobes of the legs and spines. And these shapes are continuous. You could probably leave, uh, line up 50 individuals from left to right and fill, fill in all the gaps. So this variation has made it a little bit difficult over the years to determine you know, what is the species, uh, is this variation, are these two different species. Additionally, sexual dimorphism has been a massive issue in the leaf insects. 
Because leaf insects are so difficult to find, you may find one this year in this one location, and then it may be several more years before you find another. Now, it could be the opposite sex, could be a different species. Um, very difficult sometimes. That's because females, the adult female is on the right-hand side. They're broad, they don't have flight wings. They've got those large front wings that cover and act as leaf-like uh, mimicry. They are solitary, hanging up in the canopies of the trees. Versus the males on the left-hand side, uh, those two, they're skinnier, they've got long uh, antenna, they have flight wings, and they're uh, more active. So very, very different, difficult to kind of match them up together unless you actually go through and uh, maybe you know, collect a wild female and you rear her and she lays eggs. Uh, you know, you might get lucky if you have a, a mated female where she has sexual eggs, which will hatch into males and females. Or, of course, you will have to do DNA analysis and actually match up your unknown sexes. One of the biggest issues that uh, was around for quite a while, uh, this is the genus Nanophyllium. They're a very, very small species. Some of them are actually kind of wasp mimics. They've got this kind of like a dark shine to them. This genus was named in 1906, and for over a hundred years, there were only males named. So obviously that kind of brings forward a red flag. Okay, if you have this entire genus with just males, where's the females? Well, in this particular case, the female was right under our nose. Uh, for the longest time, over a hundred years, the female nanophyllium were actually classified in a different genus. Uh, they were not actually associated with the male at all. It wasn't until 2020 where our colleagues up in the Montreal Insectarium received live eggs from a female from Papua New Guinea and out popped some male nanophyllium. So very exciting that we finally had the answer to where these uh, female nanophyllium were. One of those issues, you know, people have asked, you know, why didn't you just do DNA and, you know, match up these? Uh, for the longest time, so many of these nanophyllium males were 100 plus years old, you know, very old, fragile specimens uh, where it would have been either very expensive to extract DNA or very costly for the simple sense that it was a single specimen. You know, many of these were known from the holotype specimen, very, very old. Uh, to damage a holotype specimen would have been very, uh, very sad. But thankfully, it was great that we finally got an answer, a nice easy answer, just from re rearing some eggs, and we got to move forward and match up the males and females. So. Because of our catchy title, Lost Lovers Linked at Long Last, uh, we ended up getting catching the attention of the New York Times, and we ended up with an entire full-page spread in the New York Times, which was very, very exciting and fun to bring leaf insects to the light of day and really show people just how interesting they are. But that leaves us with an issue. Now, we finally know all these uh, males and females of the nanophyllium, but of course, who goes with who? Uh, many of these are old specimens. We don't have DNA from them. Uh, so bit by bit, we're still trying to go through and clarify everything. But the leaf insects as a whole have really gone through some massive changes in the last couple decades. This chart shows the cumul cumulative number of leaf insect species described per decade. And for the longest time, you'll see there was maybe 10, 20, 30 species the longest time, everyone assumed they were not a very interesting, not a very diverse group. Uh, it wasn't until the 2000s and 90s that all of a sudden uh, people started to dig into them a little more and focus and realize there is actually quite a diversity of species. Uh, we jumped from about 30 species to 114 in just the last couple of decades. Uh, the more we dig into them, we're realizing you know different mountaintops have different species, different islands. And that's because we're taking more of a holistic approach. Uh, for the longest time, all the adult females and all the adult males just look like leaves. They're trying to blend in. Uh, they don't want to be seen. They don't want to be observed. Uh, they're just trying to disappear into the canopy. But as you start to look at other features of the leaf insects, uh, this is a beautiful set of illustrations by Liz Sisk, one of our illustrators who's working with us, showing the freshly, illustra uh, the freshly hatched nymph. Uh, she, what she's gone, she's gone through and illustrated their colorations, their shapes, from one species to the next. And the really amazing thing with these is even closely related sister species, they can have completely different coloration. Uh, whereas the adults are almost impossible to tell apart, these uh, nymphs can be very drastically different. Also the eggs uh, between closely related species where the adults are impossible to tell apart, the egg morphology can be drastically different. So the more that we dig into the morphology of the nymphs and the eggs and these other features, we're starting to realize 
wow, okay, there's a lot of diversity going on here. These are a variety of leaf insect eggs. If they look reminiscent of seeds, uh, I would not be surprised. There's a number of seeds from the tropics that you see these and go, wow, okay, that is definitely mimicking this particular species. And all of these different eggs, they've got different frills, different structures, different textures. They are um, because of a number of different adaptations. And one of the fabulous things we've been starting to do, uh, working with T's in Germany, uh, this is a scanning electron microscope image of a uh, foot. So one of the insect legs, something that he's additionally doing is besides looking at other features is he's looking at the tarsal attachment pad textures. Uh, these are showing just some of the variety you might find in phasmids in general. Uh, these different textures allow the phasmids to um, hold on to different textures, different uh, surfaces. And so the more we dig into you know, microstructures, you know, the uh, nymphs, the eggs, uh, the tarsal attachment pads, uh, this here is a female leaf insect antennae. You see on the third antennomere, there's a line of nodes, and those are called the stridulentary file. And these are really spectacular in that different species can have different numbers of nodes, different arrangements of nodes, you know, different shapes of these teeth. And they actually do make a little bit of a sound. No, not, not very much, but uh, definitely if it were a predator that grabbed this in its mouth, uh, you would probably start to hear that squeaking. Uh, but different species you can see here on the right, different shapes of those teeth, different shape, you know, spacings, sizes. Uh, so something we'd love to dig into more deeply in the future would be to actually start to do recordings of these different sounds and see you know, how different genera, how different species actually compare uh, for different sounds. So some fun stuff that we still would love to dig into a little bit more. Also, as we're starting to just move away from just like general leaf insect uh, morphology, we start to get to look into finer details such as wing venation, uh, differences in structures of the antenna, arrangement and size of nodes and spines across the head, thorax, and different parts of the body. These, the more we dig into them, the easier it's been to actually separate out to different species and realize they are quite a diverse group. And of course, an incredibly useful tool in the last couple of years has been uh, molecular phylogeny. You know, looking at the DNA and actually comparing the DNA from one species to the next. Uh, huge shout out to the Bradler Labs, Ben and Sarah. They have sequenced so, so many specimens over the last couple of years. Uh, my good friend Stefan up in Canada and I have been sending them specimens on uh, just bombarding the, their mailbox with DNA samples. But now that we're starting to put together that phylogeny and understand how these different species are related based on their DNA, uh, so far we have over 70% of the known species sampled, so a, a decent selection across many of the big uh, prominent groups. Now that we're starting to put together this evolutionary history based on their DNA, we can start to move on to other questions and start to put things together in a completely um, novel sense, which is really exciting. One little fun character that we were able to do is because uh, we're starting to put together this evolutionary history of how the different species are related, we also have this great fossil leaf insect. This is Ophelium mesiliens, which is from a 47 million year old deposit in Germany. Uh, and this leaf insect helps us to kind of calibrate that tree of how these different species are related. So as you look through time, now that we have this calibration point of when leaf insects started to evolve, you can start to put together a geographic history as well. Uh, this is a little snapshot of Southeast Asia, and I'm gonna click through different time slots. So as you look through the evolutionary history on the left, showing these leaf insects, uh, what's diverged at what times, you can kind of look across to the geographic nature of this area. There was a lot going on many uh, tectonic plates moving around, sea level changes. And one area, an interesting point in particular, is the Pleistocene Aggregate Island Complex, the PAICs. So during the Pleistocene, there was these rises and fall in Earth's temperature. You go from warm to hot, warm to hot, or, or warm to cold, warm to cold, warm to cold. And those you know, periods of interglacial and glacial, glacial where a lot of the water on Earth was either trapped in ice or was melted and added to the sea. 
So as the ice uh, you know, comes and goes, comes and goes, the amount of water in the ocean rises and falls. So if you look on the left to this map of the world, as the oceans fall and rise, you, know, you might have a slight variations in coastlines. You know, the coastlines might expand, contract a little bit, but the earth looks pretty similar. When you look at the right-hand side and you look at Southeast Asia where the leaf insects are from, the story is very different. This rise and fall of the sea level, because of the shallow oceans in this area of Southeast Asia, it meant a lot of land masses were connected and disconnected, connected and disconnected. And that's a really significant point for Southeast Asia because that allowed species to distribute and then be isolated and then distribute again and then get isolated. So you end up with species pumps where species can you know, disperse and then they're cut off from their close relatives and they diversify. So this has been really significant for the leaf insects over the years. There's been quite a few studies looking over in the Philippines where these Pleistocene island aggregates were very significant for birds, reptiles, amphibians, different organisms. Uh, we're starting to put together, it does look like the leaf insects also were significantly um, impacted by these uh, rises and falls in the, in the sea. Uh, it's always kind of fun when you know your organism starts to follow along uh, general rules of biogeography and things start to actually work out pretty nicely. And we've got a lot of really great examples as well for uh, distribution of species and uh, this dispersal. Um, just looking at the Philippines, for example, there's typically three major routes of colonization, you know, through uh, the Palawan filter zone, Su uh, Sulu Archipelago, and then up from uh, Wallacea uh, through the Sangihe Islands up into the southern Philippines. And it looks like the leaf insects follow this perfectly. We found you know, many examples where sister species, uh, maybe on Borneo and Palawan or Palawan and Luzon, uh, this, this and that. So it's, it's really exciting starting to put together how these leaf insects are related and then relate that to biogeography and relate that to time and start to put together kind of their evolutionary history. And here is showing the different lines of faunal balance. Uh, marking these kind of deep sea trenches in between land masses that as the oceans rose and fall, some of these areas were not readily connected. And so some of these biogeographic lines of faunal balance actually work really well with a number of the genera and species of leaf insects, uh, kind of clarifying where you might or may not find certain species. Here is showing some of the uh, results of our DNA studies, looking at the relationships of these modern species, then going backwards through time to show how these different species related and when these different lineages evolved. This is a map showing that as well. So the same information just presented out in a geographic representation. So it looks like our ancestor for the modern leaf insects likely originated in Australasian or Pacific region and then diversified and distributed from there. So a number of different uh, distribution events through time uh, leading to today's quite amazing diversity of leaf insects. So now that we're starting to put together their evolutionary history of how these different species are related, now we can move on to a variety of other questions and see, okay, let's move beyond just how many species are there and how they're related. Let's move on to how these different characters have evolved. You know, what is their function? Amazing things like that. This is a fun paper we had out recently, the leaves that walk and eggs that stick, looking at the functional morphology of leaf insect eggs. As I mentioned earlier, you know, there's quite a variety of species, many, many different forms and uh, frills and spines and textures. And because of this, they've got quite a variety of different uh, functions as far as morphology. So if you look under the scanning electron microscope, you can see text, you know, different textures and nodes and frills. Uh, in some cases, you have different glues and attachment um, kind of surfaces that are in interacting with their environment in a variety of ways. So when a adult leaf insect is laying her egg, what she does is she sh simply throws it off into the universe. You know, she gives it as strong of a heave as she can, and that egg goes flying into the canopy. Because of these different varieties of textures and structures, as that egg hits different structure and surfaces, you know, on different leaves, bark, things like that, it may more likely be able to stick or slide off and then move on to a different texture. Here is an example of a leaf insect egg. Uh, up in the upper left is when it is first laid. Those frills are tucked in. They're kind of tight against the capsule. 
Once that capsule comes in contact with moisture and humidity, those frills start to expand. And those expanding frills uh, really in interact with their environment in a variety of unique ways, depending on the species. So something that my colleague Tees and his team in Germany were looking at was, how do these different species compare as far as their attachment force? You know, as an egg lands on a leaf or lands somewhere, is it likely to stick? Is it likely to stay stuck to that surface? Is it going to fall off and fall onto a different leaf? So what they ended up doing is comparing a variety of different species and looking at um, a variety of different textures they could possibly interact with, uh, hydrophobic, hydrophilic textures, uh, how many times these, in, these leaf insect eggs could attach to a surface, be pulled off and then reattach. And they found quite a variety depending on the species. It was a very interesting uh, look at um, you know, what kind of leaves these eggs are interacting with, um, where are they most likely to stick, are they more likely to fall off, and looked across a variety of species and started to put together this very interesting uh, story of you know, uh, attachment and detachment and starting to look at more of the function of how these species have got to where they are today. And because we have that DNA backbone starting to show how these different species related, you can look backwards through time and look at the evolution of these kind of complex characters and start to understand, okay, how many times did this particular trait evolve? Is this something unique to this group? Uh, what is the ancestral state? So on and so forth. So bit by bit, start to put together these different stories and interesting characteristics just by uh, digging deeper within the leaf insects. Another fun little side note that I'd love to toss in about the leaf insects that you know, be something we can explore someday or hopefully someone will dig into more deeply is if you see this, this is the coxy color. So this is the ventral surface of the coxy or basically, you know, the leaf insect armpit. Uh, looking at a variety of um, females and then one male in the upper right where that coxy color is very unique. You know, it's uh, bright blue, orange, black, purple. Um, these colors are obviously not leafy colors. This is something that is you know, not what you'd expect, you know, a flashy color from a species that's just trying to blend into its environment and disappear. But the very cool thing with these is uh, most of these photos were taken uh, kind of by holding the leaf insect down and kind of forcing it to show this uh, ventral coloration. But we are not entirely sure what in the world these colors are for. Uh, there's been a we've kind of been starting to debate back and forth okay could this be a sexual selection thing could this be a defensive flash of color uh, because many stick insects um, if you predator tries to eat them they've got little tiny colorful wings or uh, some of these other stick insects do have ventral coloration to their coxy where they're going to then flash that color and try to scare away a predator the funny thing with the leaf insects though is as we're starting to put together a list of could this be sexual selection, could this be a defensive coloration flash, the list goes one in one. As we go through and try to you know, think of both sides of the question, uh, we're always stumped as far as, you know, there's no one particular side which has come up with, oh, this must be uh, its function. So it's actually one of those fun questions I'd love to dig into more deeply and maybe someone can uh, uh, try to answer that for us someday. So just some funky little projects uh, the more you dig into the leaf insects, the more you start wondering and what's, what in the world's going on. Another little side note for uh, phasmids. This is a particular part of line of work I started doing with my PhD, looking at the phytochemistry basis of the coloration of phasmids. And you know, it's hard to argue that phasmids are spectacular at camouflage. Uh, this is a kind of a moss mimicking phasmid. Uh, phasmids come in an arrangement of colors and sizes and shapes. Um, to quite a variety of environments, you know, lichen, branches, they could be massive, they can be itty bitty, uh, they can mimic uh, sticks, moss, lichen, you know, dead leaves, a variety of these colors and textures. They've got spines, they have flaps, they've got all these different adaptations to really just blend into their environment. And this is one of my absolute favorite videos uh, showing a leaf or a stick insect uh, going from don't eat me, I'm just a stick to, okay, it's time to escape. Absolutely, absolutely just fantastic camouflage. And they blend in with a variety of colors and textures, but there's a lot going on for their evolution and for their um, camouflage evolution. And one example that I absolutely love to show, obviously, is the leaf insects. 
great uh, morphology, perfect leaf-like veins, just blending right in, great colors. And on the topic of color, when you look at uh, what makes a good mimic, you know, when a predator such as a bird wants to eat something, what is it mostly observing? So the features that make up camouflage can be you know, size, movement, textures, colors, uh, all these different features that when a bird looks at something, tend to determine if it's edible or not. And hands down, one of the most important characters when you look across all of these different elements of camouflage is usually color. So think of it like this, you know, if you have a tree full of leaf insects and they blend into the canopy, if you are the wrong color, that's an issue. Now, predators are immediately going to be able to spot you and pick you out of a crowd. So color over and over is a very, very important feature for camouflage. Um, if you're the wrong color, you're going to stand out and get eaten. But what does this have to do with carotenoids? So carotenoids are very, very important molecule in nature. They're found in a variety of places and sources, uh, mostly come from diet, such as many leafy greens, they're used as vitamins within the body, they're used in vision, they're precursors for pheromones, they use antioxidants. So there's a lot of different roles that carotenoids play in bio biology. But what I'm interested in and have been exploring the last couple of years is their role in color. So carotenoids are a very common thing that you see in leaves as far as coloration. And if you look at a carotenoid molecule, you have a long chain in the center with these functional groups on each end. So these functional groups, as those functional groups are changed or modified or have other proteins added to them, that changes the expressed coloration. Uh, currently, we know of already over 1,100 different types of carotenoids. And because of these different types, you have different colorations, different functions in uh, biology. So some lots of things to play around with. You know, you should be very familiar with uh, carotenoids. Uh, a great example showing just you know, the variety of colors you can get is actually in lobsters. So in a boiled lobster, you know, their color is bright red. That's carotenoid based. However, in the live ones, they're more blue. And that's because there is a protein that is uh, associated with that carotenoid. And that binding of the protein to the carotenoid goes from red to blue. However, when you boil a lobster, you denature that protein and it allows the carotenoid to go, go back to its bright red color. So carotenoids can be very significant in color and as well as a variety of functions. Uh, in the last couple decades, there's been a little bit of research looking at the variety of carotenoids found in phasmids. Uh, however, in historic research, people just took an entire stick insect and they would grind it up and then look for what carotenoids were present. So they're observing carotenoids from the eyes, carotenoids from the digestive system, carotenoids from you know, sexual organs and other internal organs that don't actually play a role in color. Uh, they're looking at you know, any carotenoid that's in that individual. But because I'm interested in color, uh, there's a number of reasons why I'm interested in it, not just for the adult camouflage coloration, but also there's some really cool lifestyle changes and why color is so significant. So if you think to in, uh, stick insect eggs, where they might be just be thrown out into the canopy and you know, fall to the forest floor, as the nymph hatches from the egg, it needs to blend into the forest floor, you know, browns, reds, you know, things like dead leaves on the forest floor. They don't want to look bright green at that point because they would stand out. So as soon as the leaf insect runs, you know, hatches from its egg and then runs to the nearest tree and runs up that tree, as soon as it's in the canopy, uh-oh, it's the wrong color. However, the amazing thing with phasmids is many of them have the ability to color change, just like a chameleon. Uh, very, very fun where the leaf insect, once it's hatched, runs up into the canopy and it will change its color in, you know, very quickly, you know, just a couple days, to green. So it can blend into that perfect environment. So, Many insects have their coloration based in the exocuticle, you know, that outer layer, maybe structural pigments or other uh, bright colors that are fixed. You know, the insect cannot change those colors throughout its lifetime. However, with phasmids, they actually have a kind of a clear exocuticle and their coloration is actually based in the epidermis or that living cell layer below the cuticle. So the very exciting thing with that is because this coloration is based in that living layer, as the insects either move color within those cells or can change the contents of those cells, they can actually adjust their coloration. Here's a couple examples showing uh, leaf insect color change through time. Uh, we have the males on the right where that male when it's fresh and young goes from the bright green as it 
ages. It'll actually kind of go to yellow. The adult female on the left, uh, when she was found out in the wild, she was more of a yellow color when she was out in the bright sunlight. As soon as she was brought into captivity over just a couple weeks, she started to darken up and change colors. So that's a really fantastic and obviously important feature for phasmids that are trying to blend into their arboreal habitat. Um, because color is so important for blending in and disappearing, uh, these phasmids not only have the perfect shape to blend into their in environment, but also they can adjust their colorations. So they just blend right in. So as I mentioned, some of those past works we're looking at you know, all the carotenoids inside a phasmid. So what we wanted to do is we just wanted to look at just the exoskeleton. You know, what are these carotenoids possibly being used for as far as coloration goes? So we partnered with the Long Island Aquarium. Uh, they've got a beautiful selection of really cool, beautiful species out there. Um, some different stick insects, leaf insects. Uh, so working with them, we knew exactly what food plant these insects were feeding on. Uh, on the top, that is showing the different carotenoids that were present in the bramble. So this is the species that they were raising the stick insects on. I'll see if this variety of carotenoids and then two different species were eating the same plants. So we had in the middle, we had the jungle nymph and the bottom, we have the Philippine leaf insect. So these two different species, you know, very distantly related, you know, different families. In this particular case, even though they're both kind of mimicking like a big, broad green leaf, they have a variety of different carotenoids present. So if you look at that highlighted orange spike, uh, that is beta carotene, that is a very kind of orangey color carotenoid. When it's um, present in high concentrations, it is kind of a dark orange. In lower concentrations, be more of a yellow in some cases. Uh, so the really fun thing in looking at, you know, not just grinding up a random insect and seeing what's there, actually comparing the plant versus the um, what's found in the insect is we knew what was available to them and then what they were actually sequestering into their exoskeleton. So in this particular case, both phasmids had beta cryptoxanthin in them, uh, which is you know, something that either they were selectively um, sequestering from the plant, which may have been an inc incredibly low amount, or it could have been a precursor from other carotenoids. So they might have been ingesting some of those other carotenoids, um, modifying them to create this beta cryptoxanthin. A fun thing with the leaf insect in particular is it had actually quite a few carotenoids present in the exoskeleton. Uh, it was characterized by you know, a unique carotenoid profile. However, many of them we couldn't identify. So these might be uh, a unique carotenoid unknown to science, or it could just be a very, very rare one that we weren't able to identify using our particular techniques. But something is going on with these leaf insects where there's you know, the carotenoids that they're ingesting, they're making these modifications, uh, they're sequestering them into their exoskeleton to use them for this camouflage role, uh, which makes sense. You know, there's a variety of different colorations going on. Uh, this is all one species showing just some of the variation that they can have, uh, even when they're raised on the exact same diet. Uh, so some very fun future directions that hopefully someone can tackle some days, you know, looking at um, a single species on a single host plant. When they have this coloration variation, you know, is that carotenoid based? Is there a genetic basis for this? You know, what what is driving these leaf insects to uh, modify and sequester these variations of carotenoids? So lots of fun little side projects, which would be great. Uh, hopefully someday someone can dive into the entire phasmid clade and look at the variety of carotenoids that are present across many different species and see, you know, is there an ancestral uh, trait for modifying carotenoids? You know, is there a particular carotenoid that is going to be present in all phasmid species or have certain clades which you know, mimic leaves versus mimicking bark or lichen? Is there a carotenoid basis in their exoskeleton that has either maybe allowed them to do that or that they've um, is kind of pushed in another direction? So lots of fun questions that you know, remain to be answered, but some interesting research nonetheless. So I always like to end my talks with, uh, you know, people maybe many times ask me, oh, what is your favorite leaf insect species? So I just want to toss that up real quick because I think it's just an absolutely bizarre, bizarre insect. Uh, this is Rockefeller mexectum, a uh, very, very rare species from Papua New Guinea. I just absolutely love the lobes of the abdomen. Uh, very large insect, really unique abdomen shape. Uh, unfortunately, this is the only specimen known. Uh, so this is from a very remote area in Papua New Guinea. Very damaged to this specimen, but I still think it's absolutely beautiful. Um, the, the area this was from is from the Huan Peninsula, 
Uh, we're from the Rawlinson range. And I was trying to find some, you know, nice photos of the habitat or something. And I kept getting pictures uh, like this. So there's the Rawlinson range showing uh, where the 9th Australian Division landed during World War II. So you know, a very kind of rare area, not, not collected very much, not a whole lot known about the, the biology of this area, but some really bizarre species I'd love to see someday. So thankfully, last time I was in the Natural History Museum, uh, UK, uh, British Museum, I was able to see this specimen in person and start to look at the absolutely just you know, amazing, amazing morphological adaptations to this. Uh, some, some funky morphology. So very fun to see. So thank you very much for listening today. Uh, I'm always happy to talk leaf insect. If you want to email me at wileyady.walkingleaf at gmail.com, or you can follow me and reach out on Instagram at Royce Cumming. And of course, all my publications, I make sure they are open access and freely available. So if you want to learn more about the leaf insects, you can find my work on researchdate.com. So thank you very much today. Feel free to spam me with bug questions anytime. I am happy to answer.